Hi guys, Mark Dawes, NFPS Limited, and in this short video I'd just like to answer a few commonly posed questions that, that we get asked every now and again in relation to violence at work. And the first question is, is when can an employer be held responsible for an attack or an assault on a member of staff? Uh, well, the answer to that is, is there's many, many different situations where that could occur, where an employer could have a liability towards a member of staff who's assaulted, or indeed towards a member of the public or a service user or a patient who's assaulted as a result of something staff did. But the most common one, the one that's number one on the list, is when people are expected to work alone or in isolation or in environments where there is a huge amount of understaffing, so not enough staff, staffing resources, if you like, to do the job competently. Now, what the lawyers tell us is this. They said members of staff who are left to work alone or in short-staffed environments can be particularly vulnerable to attacks or assaults. Security guards, prison officers and carers for people with challenging behaviour can be at particular risk from this kind of situation. Now, the Health and Safety Executive have published guidelines on lone working. And lone working is defined as anyone who obviously works alone, but also defined as anyone who works in isolation. So they could be in a building with lots of other people, but at that moment in time, they are left alone with someone who poses them a risk. So you can download those guidelines from the HSC website, and in fact I'll provide a link for you underneath this video where you can go and download them. But the thing to bear in mind is, is if you as an employer are expecting people to work alone or in isolation, then you need to account for the risk that those people could be exposed to. Now this doesn't just mean security staff or carers who are exposed to people who work with people who, who expose challenging behavior or potential violence. This, this is also, you know, in relation to people like teachers, for example, who may be left alone in a classroom full of children where an allegation could be made. It could be a trainer who's expected to supervise a group of people without adequate additional supervision and where an allegation could be made against them. So don't just think of this from a violence at work point of view, think of this more holistically in terms of how we work and how you expect your staff to work, either employed staff or subcontracted. Number two on the list was ignoring previous violent behavior. So, what the lawyers have told me is this, is if an employer is aware that in certain circumstances a person, another member of staff, patient or a service user, has committed violent acts in the past, or it could have been easily found out by the employer that they had done so, but that employer then takes no action and that person assaults a member of staff again, then the employer may be held very, very liable for that subsequent assault, particularly where there was previous evidence and nothing was done. Similarly, they go on to say, if a place of work has been subject to a series of violent or aggressive acts in the past, but no extra security measures were put in place, and a member of staff is injured by a subsequent act of violence, for example, then the employer in those circumstances could be held totally liable. So here we have examples where staff may be expected to arrest and restrain, but without adequate staffing levels. And once again, you know, you have that liability where the evidence is there, but some organisations, for example, will have a no-touch policy or a no-restraint policy, yet it is very apparent that restraint is taking place and the people doing the restraining, the staff, for example, are acting in the best interests of the person they're restraining in many cases, like the child or the service user. Another uh, common issue here is a lack of training or provision of use of work equipment or personal protective equipment. And once again, the lawyers say, when working in a profession where you are likely to encounter angry, violent or aggressive individuals and clients, it is important to ensure that you receive adequate and suitable training on how to defuse potentially dangerous situations and or how to control someone if required who is becoming violent. Also, personal protective equipment or provision of work equipment should be provided to try and prevent or limit the seriousness of the injury. And it is equally important to ensure that any safety equipment provided is in good working order. So once again, we're not just talking about identifying people here, we're talking about providing training. Now training must be suitable and sufficient, it must be fit for purpose. And in addition to that, we need to look at the use of equipment where required, particularly equipment which can eliminate or reduce the risk. Now it's fair to say that if this is provided, then it's also an obligation to make sure the equipment works. For example, recently I was dealing with an organisation where they were required to have defibrillators in place. Well, they had defibrillators, but the defibrillators didn't work. The staff had been trained, but the equipment didn't work. So, God forbid, if there was a serious event and a defibrillator was used, it's going to be no good. So there's some common questions that, that we get asked, and there's some common answers I, I've given you. 
I've been reading from some transcripts that have been sent to me by various lawyers. So there's some things to think about. And I'll join you on the next video and we'll talk about this more in the future. Thanks very much for listening.